Hi, I'm Tyler John. I'm a PhD student in philosophy at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Today, I'm going to be talking about the issue of political short-termism, an issue that's pretty topical and relevant at the current moment. Um, and I'm really grateful for all of you to be here with me today. I know I've got kind of a captive audience. Um, a lot of you are probably in self-quarantine due to the coronavirus right now. Um, but nonetheless, I'm really grateful for you uh, being here with me in this weird non-spatial space to talk about uh, political short-termism and representing future generations. So if you're in the effective altruism community, then you probably know a little bit about the idea of long-termism. This is the idea that the primary determinant of the value of the actions we take today is going to be their effect on the very long run future. And um, the quick and dirty argument for long-termism goes kind of like this. In expectation, the number of moral status beings in the future is extremely large. Um, humanity, to say nothing of other sentient beings, could live until the Earth is no longer inhabitable in about a billion years, or maybe even survive the end of the Earth in scattered among the stars. And so the number of expected uh, morally statist entities in the future, even if um, these chances are relatively low of scattering to the stars and so on, it, it seems to be a quite a large number in expectation. So when you couple this with a normative assumption, the assumption that one's distance from you in time is of no more moral relevance than one's distance from you in space, you get the result that actions that we can do now to significantly shape the long-term future in positive ways are generally gonna dwarf actions that we can take over the short term to benefit currently existing beings. So you might be aware that um, Politics is not exactly a hotbed of long-termists. There's a very well-known problem of political short-termism that is discussed widely in the economics and political science literature, but you'll be familiar with it probably firsthand right now. So the reason we are experiencing such a bad case of coronavirus right now has to do in part with some failures of long-term thinking, especially in the realm of pandemic preparedness and building a strong uh, public health infrastructure system that allows us to respond rapidly to pandemics. And if you've been following the news, um, a lot of political actors right now are failing to look even 10 days ahead in the future to determine what actions we should be taking now, given how the disease is going to be progressing. We've also seen this in the context of catastrophic climate change. We're seeing some of the effects of that now and going to continue to see them for a very long time. But political actors are very unwilling to do much at the present time to reduce our emissions in a way, in a significant enough way to prevent many of its negative effects. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is this issue of political short-termism, the problem of states and political actors being unwilling to take on short-term costs for much larger long-term gains. And um, before I get into this, I should thank the Fourth Eye Foundation for Global Priorities Research. They funded this project um, and I've gotten a lot of support for them. So I'm really grateful for them on, on that measure. So uh, the talk's gonna go as follows. First, I'm gonna talk about why states are so short-termist. Um, there are, again, economists and political scientists have studied this a fair bit, and we know some reasons why states are unable to take on short-term costs for long-term gains. Then I'm gonna get into some promising reforms that we can take now and in the short-term to have big long-term gains and make the state more long-termist and global institutions more long-termist. And then finally, I'm gonna get into some areas where we could use a lot more research to figure out what kinds of interventions would be beneficial. So I'm gonna list some more speculative possibilities for improving the long run future through the state, but ultimately we need a really rigorous research program in economics and in social sciences to try to figure out which institutions are getting most promising for positively shaping the long run future. So what I've done here is I've gone and assessed this literature that I've mentioned a few times and dug out all of the different interventions that have been proposed to make states less short-termist. I list 40 or so of them right here. And then I've undertaken the task of starting to evaluate these mechanisms in accordance with their effectiveness, feasibility, symbolic value, um, and so on. 
And so not a lot of these possibilities are very good ones, and I'm certainly not going to talk about all of them, but here you can see some mechanisms in the general idea of what kinds of topic will be, what topic we're going to be tackling with respect to reducing political short-termism through institutional reform. So I'm going to talk about about seven of these today in this talk, um, but many more, there may be other additional options than the ones that I'm considering that are promising, and I hope that we can increase this list a lot more through a research program on political short-termism. So let's start with the issue of why states are so short-termist in the first place, so that we can then turn to promising reforms. <clears throat> Economists and political scientists who think about political short-termism tend to divide up the causes or roots of short-termism into three different determinants. There's epistemic determinants, including rational and irrational discounting from uncertainty. We're probably pretty familiar with this. This is not a distinctly political problem. When the future is very uncertain and the benefits of any given policy are unlikely to materialize, it's just rational to discount the expected value of that intervention by the probability of it actually eventuating. But just because these, this source of short-termism is rational doesn't mean it's good. Um, ideally, we would gather a whole lot more information about what kinds of actions are likely beneficial in the future, and then there'd be less reason to rationally discount due to uncertainty. So resolving this uncertainty could make states much more long-termist. Then there's irrational discounting from uncertainty. There are many cognitive biases that affect cognition about the long run. There's hot and cold effects. There's vividness effects when the future is less vivid. Um, possibilities don't seem as likely to us. We are likely to discount the likelihood of the eventuation of very small uh, probabilities of very bad events. And there's this general issue where uh, political actors, especially members of the demos, but everyone um, economize on the information that they have by turning their attention to more reliable sources of information than the, speculating about the uncertain future. So um, when voters, for example, are trying to determine what policies to support, they don't spend much time speculating about what's possible in the future. That takes a lot of cognitive resources, but instead look at what's been happening in the very recent past and vote and support policy based on what's been happening in the recent past. And this both reduces our ability to understand long-term effects and also um, it incentivizes politicians to take actions which have short-term visible gains so that voters will remember that at the next election cycle and support them. And we'll mention that again in a moment. Second, there are motivational determinants of short-termism. Well, the most widely studied and discussed is that of pure time preference. People seem to discount future events merely because they're in the future. There's basically no consensus about what the structure of this time preference is and how severe it is. The literature is all over the place on how strong people's time preferences are and when they're biased by time. But there is quite a significant amount of consensus that people do have a pure time preference towards the future. Um, second, there's both determinants of self-interest and relational partiality. So think about this simple, obvious, everyday fact. None of us will ever meet people who don't live at the same time as us, okay? Um, ourselves, our friends, our family members, everyone who we're ever gonna interact with are members of currently existing generations, our contemporaries. And so if we prioritize policy decisions based on the matter, based on our self-interest or based on what's good for um, our friends and family, this will then make us more short termists as well. Now, there are also various cognitive biases that affect motivation. There's the identified versus the statistical lives effect, which we see very starkly in the case of long-term future decisions. And there are a number of short-term interest groups which motivate politicians to prioritize short-termist policy. Finally, there are institutional determinants of short-termism. These are determinants that make political actors unable to take long-termist actions, even when they're properly informed and properly motivated. So there are, for example, re-election incentives, which we've touched on briefly earlier. Because uh, lots of like politicians really want to get elected, um, they're going to tend to do things that have visible short-term symbolic effects on the short term so that um, voters, when they try to decide, when they go to the polls and decide who they're going to vote for, uh, support them rather than trying to impose short-term costs for long-term gain, which will then get them booted out of office. 
So these re-election incentives have been discussed pretty widely, but there are lots of other institutional determinants. Um, there's issues of economic dependence. Political actors are often economically dependent for fundraising and campaigning on short-term interest groups. Um, the elderly may make society more short-termist, but this I should say is extremely unclear. There's some reason to think that elderly people in virtue of the fact that they're not going to live as long and so have some self-interested reasons as well as perhaps some relational reasons to discount future gains um, causes the state to be short-termist. But the literature on this is also a mess. It's all over the place. And so if there is an effect from the influence of the elderly, it's likely pretty small or we haven't found it yet. Political polarization and obstructionism keeps political actors from thinking about things in collaborative and thoughtful ways. Uh, there's issues of time inconsistency where one political leader can institute a policy which is then repealed by the next person in office, which we've seen in a lot of cases where institutions for future generations have actually been implemented. And if we have very weak institutions, we of course can't take actions which are going to affect the very long term. So again, we have epistemic determinants, motivational determinants, and institutional determinants of a wide variety. So when we're thinking about how to make the state less short-termist and build a long-termist political culture, we need to think about addressing all of these different sources of short-termism. Addressing some of them is great and will improve the long-run future. But over the long run, we need to continue to address each of these different determinants of short-termism to make sure that all of them are accounted for. So now that we've looked at the causes of short-termism, let's look at some reforms that could reduce this amount of short-termism. So the best reforms are gonna be effective. They're gonna have a large effect if they're actually successfully implemented, ideally on very long timelines. They're going to be feasible and sustainable. So they're gonna be policies that we can actually implement in the world and that aren't gonna be repealed within an election cycle. Um, there is a very important place for political action that tries to implement reforms in small jurisdictions that are much more risky. We need people to be taking on political risks so that we can see the effects of policy. Um, but for this part of the presentation, I'm gonna be prioritizing interventions that are easy to implement in the near future. And so feasible and sustainable if, um, interventions are some of the best ones. Third, they should be backed with strong evidence. And this relates to feasibility and sustainability. Politicians don't wanna be test subjects. They want to support and back policies that are proven to be effective. And so um, if there's good academic evidence or it's been implemented before, that'll really help the feasibility and sustainability of the institution. And finally, they should ideally be powerful symbols, signaling to everyone the world over in the state and in other states that the future is of great importance and that political short-termism is a bad issue that must be ameliorated. So taking those reforms sorry, taking those characteristics of good reforms together, let's look at some three different possible reforms that we could be implementing in the near future to, for long-term gain. The first reform is in government research institutes for future generations. So this is pretty self-explanatory. These are gonna be research institutes in some office of the state, which try to figure out um, relevant information about policies that affect the long run future and about the long run future itself. There have been variants of this employed in Singapore. The Center for Strategic Futures is there, of CSF you see on the slide. And the Center for Strategic Futures is in the Prime Minister's office and has really helped Singapore, um, especially when thinking about low risks of very bad events. Scotland has a Scottish Futures Forum. Uh, Finland actually has a parliamentary committee that serves as a think tank for matters of uh, long-term interests. Um, in the US, once upon a time, had the Office of Technology Assessment, which um, despite its name actually evolved into an institute that was predicting, that was engaging not just in technological prediction, but also in other kinds of prediction that was of long-term importance to the US until it was abolished in the 90s. And you might actually hear about the OTA um, pretty soon because there's been a lot of policy wonks who've been calling for a reestablishment of the OTA because they've argued that um, the elimination of the OTA was extremely harmful to the U.S.'s ability to think about the long term. And there's actually a bill in the House now um, supporting 
the re-establishment of the OTA. So again, what these research institutions are going to do is they're going to gather information about the future, but they can also have various archiving responsibilities. So they can archive facts about who supported what kinds of policies, what the effects of these policies were, and this can allow us to simplify policy causation and better understand who's supporting good policy and what good policy looks like. And so if research institutes for future generations are able to do these, play these two roles, they can serve an epistemic and a motivational role in um, ameliorating the effects of short-termism by giving us more information and by making risks and consequences salient to the general public and to various political actors so that there's some political pressure for them to actually take the long-term beneficial um, intervention. These tend to be low cost. Um, I have some personal experience on this matter. Academics are pretty cheap. Um, we're not paid a whole lot. So um, if you can hire a bunch of academics to be part of a research institute, it doesn't generally cost the government very much. Um, and it should also be relatively nonpartisan compared to a lot of other interventions we could seek because we're just getting information. Now, the best forms of research institutes for future generations should be independent from government influence and in particular from the political business cycle. We don't want it to get wrapped up into the government's own short termism. It should have broad scope to consider all different areas of long term interest and balance trade offs between these different areas. And it should have really good access to information so that it can do its job. So much for research institutes for future generations. I think this is quite a promising uh, policy that should be pursued much more. I hope the OTA gets reestablished. Um, second, we should consider posterity impact assessments. So posterity impact assessments are similar to their cousin environmental impact assessments, which are ubiquitous, ubiquitous I'm sorry, which are ubiquitously required um, across all over the world for um, bills that are proposed for construction projects and other kinds of um, activities that could interact, that could negatively affect the environment. So environmental impact assessments are widely hailed as basically a good piece of common sense um, reasoning that give us much more information about the impacts of our actions and so should be widely used. Now, um, the UK Future Generations Bill, which has been supported by Lord Byrd and is currently in the House of Lords, great bill um, actually proposes these prosperity impact assessments for the UK. And on the proposal, um, any bill that's proposed uh, needs to assess the impact um, of that bill on the, future, on the future for the next 25 years or explain why they haven't made such an impact assessment. Um, the Future Generations Bill also proposes a couple other policies which I think are great policies, but I won't be able to discuss today. It proposes a joint select committee in the UK, as well as a commissioner for future generations to set a bunch of well-being targets for the long-term future and have some soft power institution that's able to persuade uh, public bodies to pursue these goals. Um, but for now, our focus is on the posterity impact assessments. So posterity impact assessments um, have play both an epistemic and a motivational role. They give us information about the impact of policy, and they can serve as a really good liability mechanism to ensure that politicians don't take actions which adversely affect the long-term future, or if they do, find ways to mitigate the impacts of those effects in the future. Uh, it's a relatively low-risk policy. Not a lot can go wrong unless these impact assessments become quite obstructive and unwieldy and really slow the machines, uh, slow the gears of government. And it should be fairly low on its partisanship because, again, we're just learning information about the future, the impacts of these policy interventions. Now, the ideal posterity impact assessments are going to be applicable. They're going to apply to most decisions that government actors make. They're going to be enforceable, um, finding some way to enforce these, whether through public sanction or through court system, seems quite important. And they should not have a budget window or a rate of pure time preference. So they shouldn't say we need to, just to kind of um, critique the, the bird bill for a moment, um, they shouldn't say that we should only evaluate the impacts for a certain period of time. They should ideally evaluate the impacts in perpetuity. Um, 
because otherwise political actors can shift the burdens of policy outside of the budget window. Harder to do on 25 year timelines. That's a laudable feature that it's such a long timeline in the future generations bill, but still possible to do. And so budget windows um, are suboptimal as is um, time preference or discounting the future. So prosperity impacts are another, I think, high impact intervention we could see in the near future. Third are futures assemblies. So futures assemblies are a kind of citizens assembly that fulfills the explicit role of representing future generations. So what's a citizens assembly? Well, citizens assemblies are randomly selected bodies of ordinary citizens who are brought into one room and they deliberate together about matters of policy. And they then um, function as a kind of soft power political institution by giving recommendations to government based on their deliberations. So these citizens assemblies have been employed in the UK, Ireland, um, Canada and more. You can actually see on the picture on the bottom right hand side of the slide, nice colorful image of all the different places citizens assemblies have been employed. Features assemblies have been praised for being informed, statistically representative, unelected, nonpartisan, financially independent, deliberative mini publics. So to break that down, they're informed because they're empowered to bring in experts on to inform the decision making process. There's usually a stratified random sample of the population. And so they should be perfectly statistically representative of the larger population. They're unelected, which means there's none of these perverse electability incentives that we've talked about earlier. Um, and also no fundraising incentives that we've talked about earlier by being financially independent. They're nonpartisan because they're just people who are brought into a room, not members of political parties. And so they're not be beheld to those parties either. And they're deliberative, they discuss together um, about relevant issues. And one thing that we've seen when citizens assemblies have been implemented is that they tend to really reduce partisan polarization. People tend to converge um, towards the middle on their viewpoints rather than becoming more polarized in their views. And so the future, a citizens assembly seemed like a nice way of reducing polarization, increasing cooperation and serious deliberative thought about the long term. Um, a futures assembly, which serves the purpose of explicitly representing future generations, uh, solves some institutional problems, namely perverse election fundraising um, and party incentives. And it also has an important motivational and epistemic role. These futures assemblies are given the a task of bringing in experts and thinking about good policy. And so we should learn a lot more about what good policy in the long term would be. And they also uh, motivate the state to cooperate with what the citizen assembly has asked for, because um, the, again, this is a statistically represented sample of the US public. And if they, if the government systematically ignoring them, that um, smells of illegitimacy and threatens um, public approval. So future assembly should ideally be large. This is to reduce corruption. If most of the members of the citizens assembly can be picked off by industry. Um, that's not gonna be a good look for citizens assemblies. They should be single issue focused on the future. Um, though that's a variety of issues, it's in a sense a single issue in an important sense. Um, and this is so that they can, the members of the citizens assembly can build expertise in a short period of time. They should be well paid so people from um, all kinds of economic strata can participate and also to help prevent some corruption issues. And they should have short terms, again, to pre help prevent corruption because we're continuously cycling the members of the assembly. So we've gone through features assemblies, posterity impact assessments, as well as uh, in government research institutes for regenerations. And I think these are three promising, um, very strongly evidentially supported policies that we could be taking forward right now to implement in governments. I want to turn now to a few issues where we need further research to figure out um, whether these policies are promising, but some potentially promising policies um, that we should evaluate. The first is pay for, pay for performance. Pay for performance is widely used across industry in the private sector, um, but it's not used in the public sector. And the reasons for this is, are complicated. There's a very um, lively debate about whether 
paid performance would work well in the public sector. There's some evidence that suggests that public servants are more intrinsically motivated than motivated by pay, and so it doesn't work very well. But um, this needs a lot more attention. It could be that certain pay schemes would help incentivize public service workers to think about the long-term future. Um, some possibilities are to tie their pension payment to their uh, performance or the government's performance. This idea was suggested to me by Will McCaskill and Aaron Belinder. Um, though there are some issues about with this because he will want financial stability late in life, as Danny Bressler has pointed out to me. So I think this issue, the structure of what pay performance would look like and whether it would be good needs much more attention. A second issue is longer election cycles. There's a literature on political economy on um, term limits, but there's only a few studies on whether longer election cycles make legislation more efficient and better. Um, and there's very little on whether it actually increases, decreases the amount of short-termism among political actors. So this needs much more attention, but, but there's a, a priori case for thinking that it would decrease short-termism among political actors, namely by reducing election incentives so that people can act over slightly longer timelines and worry slightly less about re-election. Third is demony voting. <clears throat> so demony voting is just giving additional votes to parents to vote on behalf of their children. There's some evidence coming out of the Coaching Institute for Future Design that when parents vote on explicitly on behalf of their children, they do vote in a more long-termist way. <clears throat> and we could have this not just for parents, but we could also just give votes to ordinary citizens and tell them to vote on behalf of future, future citizens. And um, given the evidence in demony voting, this might actually have a, a significant effect on what kinds of representatives are elected. But again, it needs much more research. <clears throat> the fourth is intergenerational externality taxes. So this is basically just broadening um, the very promising reform of carbon taxes to think about all kinds of actions and policies which impose long-term externalities. So one fun example that um, Will McCaskill raised to me is the example of helium. Helium is a non-renewable -re resource. It, you use it, it just floats away. And there was a brief period where um, we were quite concerned that the US helium reserve was gonna run out of helium. And that's bad because it's not only used to blow up like balloon animals, but also to um, support rockets and various kinds of magnetic imagery in hospitals. It turns out we have much more helium than we thought we did, but um, this is a good example of ways that various consumption and production decisions can have positive and negative externalities on the long-term future, which might be regulated efficiently uh, through pricing with externality taxes. And finally, um, many long-term issues require strong global governance. And the reason is because these issues are global public goods games where we require strong coordinated action on behalf of many actors to um, ensure that these public goods are preserved. So we see this <clears throat> starkly in the case of climate change, in the case of AI governance, in the case of um, nuclear warfare, which are three different causes that EAs care quite a bit about. And so there's been a lot of um, talk and indeed research in the EA community on what good global governance would look like. And I think this should continue under the broad umbrella of thinking about how we can make the world, world, world governments, as well as all states under the world government's control, less short-termist and more focused in the long-term. So again, these are areas where there's nothing that I know of that we can implement right away, um, but there's lots of, promise here and good research is needed. Now in the long run, I think that the kinds of moderate interventions that I've been talking about throughout this presentation are not gonna cut ice. These are going to be um, too weak to make states uh, long-termist in the way that effective altruists want and we'll need much more robust, stronger, more energetic institutions over the long run. Um, more energetic institutions are likely to be repealed if they pass at all at the present time. But over the long run, we really need to employ um, interventions in every area of government which help reduce short-termism significantly. So we could have a chamber for the future in the legislative branch on a par with the Senate and the House of Representatives. 
we can have a secretary of future generations, which sits in the cabinet, in which runs various executive agencies, which control machinery to benefit the long-term future. And we can have a court of generations, which strikes down laws that are in contempt of future generations. Um, <clears throat> now, these are all very speculative and, again, um, not well-supported uh, interventions because there's not very much evidence about whether they'd be good or bad. Um, but these are the kinds of utopian reforms that the literature is not thinking about right now, but that we need to start thinking about so that we can implement very strong institutions to benefit the long-run future over the longer term. And so I'd like to see more research on this as well. So I've talked about why states are short-termist, short what some promising reforms might be, and then I've concluded with some areas of further research. Now, um, in closing, I want to note that, um, as we've seen, given the different promising reforms in the areas where research is needed, the issues of political short-termism are serious, but they're not necessary and they're not inevitable. And if we were able to re-engineer the government to be much less short-termist and focus on the long-term, uh, indeed, make all governments much more focused on the long term, then we'd have the ability to use their massive $25 trillion of global government resources annually to promote the long-term future. We'd be able to use their profound normative authority and their coercive control over every human being on the planet um, to ensure that we make the future go as well as possible. And so I think there's a ton of very promising intervention that we can take here that could vastly improve the value of the long-term future. So thanks very much for being here for this presentation. Um, I'd like to thank all of the listed commentators for um, and supporters for their help with this project. And I'd like to thank you again all for being here. Thanks very much.